one, two, three, one, two, three, four. Now over to Polly. One, two, three, one, two, three, four. Now, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> now back to me, blah, 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 blah. Okay, we're ready. Uh, what's your name and what do you do? My name is Platon. I'm a photographer, but really my job is to connect with people. I was looking uh, at your website, and you have uh, a section on human rights mm. in America, mm -hmm. and you have a portrait of the Little Rock Nine. Mm. Uh, how do you keep a human connection with such a large group? My job is actually to create a connection with people first. Photography is not the most important part. It's the human element. So with the Little Rock Nine, that was a really difficult shoot. Um, we decided to fly in all the members of the Little Rock Nine back to their high school where they once made history many, many years ago. And I remember we got them all in line and you can see their Gothic high school in the distance. And there was a woman in the middle of the group and her name was Elizabeth Eckford. And she had her head held up rather awkward like this. And, and I just thought, it doesn't really get in line with everyone else. So now you have to go back to the late 50s when they all went to this high school. And Elizabeth was 16 years old, I believe, and she was going to her school one day and she got separated from all her friends and she gets attacked by an angry mob of white mothers. And it is the most disgusting, shameful part of American history you're ever gonna see. So roll on many, many years and she's standing in front of me. And I shouted out to her, excuse me, would you mind lowering your head a little? Because it looks a little awkward and I'm trying to get everyone in balance. And she changed and she said, young man, don't you ever ask me to lower my head. I hold up my chin high with pride because of what we did. And at that point, they all looked at each other they all raised their heads together up to her level in pride and then they all held hands and i got a picture of that and she said you've got to understand that this photograph is not just a picture of elderly people standing in front of a school this picture is about our struggle to fight for justice and equality in American society. Another, uh, a lot of pictures actually, showed things relating or people relating to Martin Luther King. Mm. I was wondering, like this must be how you take a portrait of Martin Luther King without actually being able to take a portrait picture of Martin Luther King. You know, Martin Luther King was assassinated in 1968 so how do you make a portrait of him when he's not there? So I went to his church in Atlanta where he used to preach and his father used to preach there as well. And uh, there's a very famous neon sign outside the church. It's all lit up and it's exactly the same sign that they had when Martin Luther King was there. So I decided to invite uh, some of his closest friends to come to the church to be photographed all together. And by photographing all his friends and the church, you get a sense of the man that's gone. We had C.T. Vivian, then you had Joseph Lowry, 
then you had Andrew Young, and then there was this really old guy called Fred Shuttlesworth. Now, by the time I was going to photograph them all, Fred Shuttlesworth was very, very ill. In fact, he'd recently had a very big stroke and he couldn't walk, but he still insisted on coming to the shoot. He didn't want to miss it because he knew we we're going to pay tribute to Martin Luther King. So his family flew him to the church and he came in a wheelchair. Being in a wheelchair, visually, I've got the sign of the church outside, but that's up there. And he's in the wheelchair down there. So I thought, how do I do this? How do I bring everything together? So I brought the wheelchair underneath the sign of the church. And then I lied down on the floor, on the pavement. And I shot straight up. So I get looking up at the chair, you see Fred Shuttlesworth in the chair. Then you see the light of the neon light just above him. And then I asked the other three civil rights heroes to lean over his chair and get as close to him as possible. And as they all leaned in, and I was struggling to get the picture, they all said, let us pray. So they all closed their eyes and said a prayer to Martin Luther King. And I remember they, at the end of the day, they invited me into the church and they gave me a tour. And Martin Luther King's chair was still there after all these years where he used to sit and make his notes before his sermons. So I photographed his chair. And it was another way of showing a study of Martin Luther King without him being there, the empty chair. If you are not judgmental, but curious, and you talk to them and you dare to ask them the things that you genuinely want to know in your heart, then you discover the most amazing lessons in life. And at the end of the day in Martin Luther King's church, C.T. Vivian, who's one of the gentlemen leaning in on top. He took me into the community centre room and I took another picture of him and he pointed up to the stars and he closes his eyes and he says, reach for the stars, my brother Platon. Reach for the stars. You will never ever touch them, but they will take you higher.